Hello! And welcome, and welcome to Larry's Library. Library. Hello, welcome to Larry's Library. We just started reading Swiss Family Robinson yesterday. The ship wrecked. They spent the night in the ship getting ready to <clears throat> head for shore the next day. And so chapter two, a landing and consequent occupations. Remember, right now they're still in the ship. By the break of day, we were all awake and alert, for hope as well as grief is unfriendly to lengthened slumbers. When we had finished our morning prayer, I said, We now, my best beloved, with the assistance of heaven, must enter upon the work of our deliverance. The first thing to be done is to give to each poor animal on board a hearty meal. We will then put food enough before them for several days. We cannot take them with us, but we will hope it may be possible, if our voyage succeeds, to return and fetch them. Are you now all ready? Bring together whatever is absolute ne absolutely necessary for our wants. It is my wish that our first cargo should consist of a barrel of gunpowder, three fowling pieces and three carbines with as much small shot and lead and as many bullets as our boat will carry, two pairs of pocket pistols and one of large ones, not forgetting a mold to cast balls in. Each of the boys and their mother also should have a bag to carry game in. You will find plenty of these in the cabins of the officers. We added a chest containing cakes of portable soup, another full of hard biscuits, an iron pot, a fishing rod, a chest of nails, and another of different utensils, such as hammers, saws, pincers, hatchets, augers, etc. And lastly, some sailcloth to make a tent. Indeed. The boys brought so many things that we were obliged to reject some of them, though I had already exchanged the worthless ballast for articles of use and the question of our subsistence. When all was ready, we stepped bravely each into a tub. At the moment of our departure, the cocks and hens began to cluck as if conscious that we had deserted them, yet were willing to bid us a sorrowful adieu. This suggested to me the idea of taking the geese, ducks, fowls, and pigeons with us, observing to my wife that if we could not find meats to feed them, at least they would feed us. We accordingly executed this plan. We put ten hens and an old and young cock into one of the tubs and covered it with planks. We set the rest of the poultry at liberty in the hope that instinct would direct them towards the land, the geese and the ducks by water and the pigeons by the air. We were waiting for my wife, who had the care of this last part of our embarkation, when she joined us loaded with a large bag, which she threw into the tub that already contained her youngest son. I imagined that she intended it for him to sit upon, or perhaps to confine him, so as to prevent his being tossed from side to side. I, therefore, asked no more questions concerning it. The order of our departure was as follows. In the first tub, at the boat's head, my wife, the most tender and exemplary of her sex, placed herself. In the second, our little Francis, a lovely boy, six years old, remarkable for the sweetest and happiest temper and for his affection to his parents. In the third, Fritz, our eldest boy, between 14 and 15 years of age. In the fourth was the barrel of gunpowder with the cocks and hands and the sailcloth. In the fifth, the provisions of every kind. In the sixth, our third son, Jack, a light-hearted, enterprising, audacious, generous lad, about ten years old. And the seventh, our second son, Ernest, a boy of twelve years old, of a rational, reflecting temper, well informed for his age, but somewhat disposed to indolence and pleasure. In the eighth, a father, whose paternal care the task of guiding the machine for the safety of his beloved family was entrusted. Each of us had useful implements within reach. The hand of each held an oar, and near each was a swimming apparatus in readiness for what might happen. The tide was already at half its height when we left the ship, and I had counted on this circumstance as favorable to our want of strength. We held the two paddles long ways, and thus we passed without accident through the cleft of the vessel into the sea. The boys devoured with their eyes the blue land they saw at a distance. We rowed with all our strength but long in vain to reach it. The boat only turned round and round. At length I had the good fortune to steer in such a way that it proceeded in a straight line. The two dogs, perceiving we had abandoned them, plunged into the sea and swam to the boat. They were too large for us to think of giving them admittance, and I dreaded lest they should jump in and upset us. Turk was an English dog, and Flora a bitch of the Danish breed. 
I was in great uneasiness on their account, for I feared it would not be possible for them to swim so far. The dogs, however, managed the affair with perfect intelligence. When fatigued, they rested their forepaws on one of the paddles, and thus with little effort proceeded. Jack was disposed to refuse them this accommodation, but he soon yielded to my argument that it was cruel and unwise to neglect creatures thrown on our protection, and who indeed might hereafter protect us in their turn by guarding us from harm and assisting in our pursuit of animals for food. Besides, added I, God has given the dog to man to be his faithful companion and friend. Our voyage proceeded securely, though slowly, but the nearer we approached the land, the more gloomy and uncompromising its aspect appeared. The coast was clothed with barren rocks, which seemed to offer nothing but hunger and distress. The sea was calm, the waves gently agitated, washed the shore, and the sky was serene in every direction. We perceived casks, bales, chests, and other vestiges of shipwrecks floating around us. In the hope of obtaining some good provisions, I determined on endeavoring to secure some of the casks. I bade Fritz have a rope, a hammer, and some nails ready, and try to seize them as we passed. He succeeded in laying hold of two, and in such a way that we could draw them after us to the shore. Now that we were close on land, its rude outline was much softened. The rocks no longer appeared one undivided chain. Fritz, with his hawk's eye, already described some trees and exclaimed that they were palm trees. Ernest expressed his joy that he should now get much larger and better coconuts than he had ever seen before. I, for my part, was venting audibly my regret that I had not thought of bringing a telescope that I knew was in the captain's cabin. When Jack drew a small one from his pocket and with a look of triumph presented it to me. On applying it to my eye, I remarked that the shore before us had a desert and savage aspect, but that towards the left the scene was more agreeable. But when I attempted to steer in that direction, a current carried me irresistibly towards the coast that was rocky and barren. By and by we perceived a little opening between the rocks near the mouth of a creek, towards which all our geese and ducks betook themselves, and I, relying on their sagacity, followed in the same course. This opening formed a little bay. The water was tranquil and neither too deep nor too shallow to receive our boat. I entered it and cautiously put on shore to a spot where the coast was about the same height above the water as our tubs and where at the same time there was a quantity sufficient to keep us afloat. All that had life in the boat jumped eagerly on land. The dogs who had swum on shore received us as if appointed to do the honors of the place, jumping round us with every demonstration of joy. The geese kept up a loud cackling to which the ducks from their broad yellow beaks contributed a perpetual thorough bass. The cocks and hands which we had already set at liberty clucked. The boys, chattering all at once, produced altogether an overpowering confusion of sounds. To this was added the disagreeable scream of some penguins and flamingos which we now perceived, the latter flying over our heads, the others sitting on the points of the rocks at the entrance to the bay. The first thing we did on finding ourselves safe on terra firma was to fall on our knees and return thanks to the supreme being who had preserved our lives and to recommend ourselves with entire resignation to the care of his paternal guidance, kindness. We next employed our whole attention in unloading the boat. We looked about for a convenient place to set up a tent under the shade of the rocks and having all consulted and agreed upon a place we set to work. We drove one of our poles firmly into a fissure of the rocks. This rested upon another pole, which was driven perpendicularly into the ground and formed the ridge of our tent. A frame for a dwelling was thus made secure. We next threw some sailcloth over the ridge and stretching it to a convenient distance on each side, fastened its, it ex, fastened its extremities to the ground with stakes. Lastly, I fetched some tenter hooks along the edge of one side of the sailcloth in front that we might be able to enclose the entrance during the night by hooking in the opposite edge. The chests of provisions and other heavy matters we had left on the shore. The next thing was to desire my sons to look about for grass and moss to be spread and dried in the sun to serve us for beds. During this occupation, I erected near the tent a kind of little kitchen. A few flat stones I found in the bed of a freshwater river served for a hearth. I got a quantity of dry branches. With the largest, I made a small enclosure around it, and with the little twigs added to some of our turf, I made a brisk, cheering fire. 
We put some of the soup cakes with water into our iron pot and placed it over the flame, and my wife, with my little Francis for a scullion, took charge of preparing the dinner. In the meanwhile, Fritz had been reloading the guns, with one of which he had wandered along the side of the river. He had proposed to Ernest to accompany him, but Ernest replied that he did not like a rough stony walk, and that he should go to the seashore. Jack took the road towards a chain of rocks which jutted out into the sea with the intention of gathering some of the mussels which grew upon them. My own occupation was now an endeavor to draw the two floating casks on shore, but in which I could not succeed, for our place of landing, though convenient enough for our machine, was too steep for the cask. While I was looking about to find a more favorable spot, I heard loud cries proceeding from a short distance and recognized the voice of my son Jack. I snatched my hatchet and ran anxiously to his assistance. I soon perceived him up to his knees in water in a shallow, and that a large lobster had fastened its claws in his leg. The poor boy screamed pitiably and made useless efforts to disengage himself. I jumped, in, I jumped instantly into the water, and the enemy was no sooner sensible of my approach than he let go of his hold and would have scampered out to sea, but that I indulged the fancy of a little malice against him for the alarm he had caused us. I turned quickly upon him and took him up by the body and carried him off, followed by Jack, who shouted our triumph all the way. He begged me at last to let him hold the animal in his own hand, that he might himself present so fine a booty to his mother. Accordingly, having observed how I held it to avoid the grip, he laid his own hand upon it in exactly the same manner, but scarcely had he grasped it than he received a violent blow on the face from the lobster's tail, which made loose its hold and the animal fell to the ground. Jack again began to bawl out while I could not refrain from laughing heartily. In his rage, he took up a stone and killed the lobster with a single blow. Ernest, ever prompted by his savory tooth, bawled out that the lobster had better be put in the soup, which would give it an excellent flavor. But this his mother opposed, observing that we must be more economical of our provisions than that, for the lobster of itself would furnish a dinner for the whole family. I now left them and walked again to the scene of this adventure and examined the shallow. I then made another attempt upon the two casks, and at length succeeded in getting them into it and in fixing them securely on their bottoms. On my return, I complimented Jack on his being the first to procure an animal that might serve for subsistence. <clears throat> ah, but I have seen something, too, that is good to eat, said Ernest, and I should have got it if it had not been in the water so that I must have, got, must have wetted my feet. Oh, that is a famous story, cried Jack. I can tell you what we saw. Some nasty mussels. Why, I would not eat one of them for the world. Think of my lobster. That is not true, Jack, for they were oysters and not mussels that I saw. I am sure of it, for they stuck to the rock, and I know they must be oysters. Fortunate enough, my dainty gentleman, interrupted I, addressing myself to Ernest, since you are so well acquainted with the place where such food can be found, you will be so obliging as to return and procure us some. In such a situation as ours, every member of the family must be actively employed for the common good, and above all, none must be afraid of so trifling an inconvenience as wet feet. I will do my best with all my heart, answered Ernest, and at the same time I will bring home some salt, of which I have seen immense quantities in the holes of the rocks, where I have reason to suppose it is dried by the sun. I tasted some of it, and it was excellent. He set off and soon returned. What he brought, <coughs> what he brought had the appearance of sea salt, but was so mixed with earth and sand that I was on the point of throwing it away. But my wife prevented me, and by dissolving and afterwards filtering some of it through a piece of muslin, we found it admirably fit for use. Why could we not have used some sea water, asked Jack, instead of having all this trouble? So we might, answered I, if it, did not, if it had not a somewhat sickly taste. While I was speaking, my wife tasted the soup with a little stick which she had been stirring it with, and pronounced that it was all the better for the salt, and now quite ready. But, said she, Fritz has not come in, and then how shall we manage to eat our soup without spoons or dishes? <clears throat> Why did we not remember to bring some from the ship? Because, my dear, one cannot think of everything at once. Mm -hmm. We shall be lucky if we have not forgotten even more important things. But, <clears throat> but indeed, said she, this is a matter which cannot easily be set to rights. How will it be possible for each of us to raise this large boiling pot to his lips? 
I soon saw that my wife was right. We all cast our eyes upon the pot with a sort of stupid perplexity and looked a little like the fox in the fable when the stork desires to help him desires him to help himself from a vessel with a long neck. Silence was at length broken by all bursting into a hearty laugh at our want of every kind of utensil and at the thought of our own folly in not recollecting that spoons and forks were things of absolute necessity. Ernest observed that if we could but get some of the nice coconuts he often thought about, we might empty them and use the pieces of the shells for spoons. Yes, yes, replied I, if we could but get... But we have them not, and if wishing were to any purpose, I had as soon wish at once for a dozen silver spoons. But, alas, of what use is wishing? But at least, said the boy, we can use some oyster shells for spoons. Why, this is well, Ernest, said I, and is what I call a useful thought. Run then quickly for some of, or run then quickly for some of them. Jack ran first and was up to his knees in the water before Ernest could reach the place. Jack tore off the fish with eagerness and threw them to slothful Ernest, who put them into his handkerchief. Fritz, not having yet returned, his mother was, re <clears throat> was beginning to be uneasy when we heard him shouting to us from a small distance, to which we answered by similar sounds. In a few minutes he was among us, his two hands behind him, and with a sort of would-be melancholy air, which none of us could well understand. "'What have you brought?' asked his brothers. "'Let us see your booty, you then you shall see ours.' Ah, uh, I have, unfortunately, nothing. What? No, nothing at all, said I. Nothing at all, answered he, but now on fixing my eye upon him, I perceived a smile of proud success to his assumed dissatisfaction. At the same instant, Jack, having stolen behind him, exclaimed, A sucking pig! A sucking pig! Fritz, finding his trick discovered, now proudly displayed his prize, which I immediately perceived from the description I had read in different books of travels, was an agouti, an animal common in that country, and not a sucking pig, as the boys had supposed. Fritz related that he had passed over to the other side of the river. Ah, continued he, it is quite another thing from this place. The shore is low, and you can have no notion of the quantity of casks, chests, and planks, and different sorts of things washed there by the sea. Ought we not to tr go and try and obtain some of these treasures? We will consider it of it soon, answered I. But first we have to make our voyage to the vessel and fetch away the animals. At least you will all agree that of the cow we are pretty much in want. If our biscuit were soaked in milk, <clears throat> if our biscuit were soaked in milk, it would not be so hard, observed our dainty Ernest. I must tell you too, continued Fritz, that over on the other side there is as much grass for pasturage as we can desire and besides a wood, in the shade of which we could repose. Why, then, should we remain on this barren desert side? Patience, replied I. There is a time for everything, friend Fritz. We shall not be without something to undertake tomorrow and even after tomorrow. But above all, I am eager to know if you discovered in your excursion any traces of our ship companions. Not the smallest trace of man, dead or alive, on land or water, replied Fritz. Soon after we had taken our meal, the sun began to sink into the west. Our little flock of fowls assembled round us, pecking here and there what morsels of our biscuit had fallen on the ground. Just at this moment, my wife produced the bag she had so mysteriously huddled into the tub. Its mouth was now opened. It contained the various sorts of grain for feeding poultry, barley, peas, oats, etc., and also different kinds of seeds and roots of vegetables for the table. In the fullness of her kind heart, she scattered several handfuls at once upon the ground, which the fowls began eagerly to seize. Our pigeons sought a roosting place among the rocks. The hens, with the two cocks at their head, ranged themselves in a line along the ridge of the tent, and the geese and ducks betook themselves in a body, cackling and quacking as they proceeded to a marshy bit of ground near the sea, where some thick bushes afforded them shelter. A little later, we began to follow the example of our winged companions by beginning our preparations for repose. First, we loaded our guns and pistols and laid them carefully in the tent. Next, we assembled together and joined in offering up our thanks to the Almighty for the succor afforded us and supplicating his watchful care for our preservation. With the last ray of the sun, we entered our tent, and after drawing the sailcloth over the hooks to close the entrance, 
We laid ourselves down close to each other on the grass and moss we had collected in the morning. And that's the end of chapter two. Tomorrow, chapter three, Voyage of Discovery. This has been Larry's Library. Thank you very much. Adios. Yes, Bye. I am learning Spanish. Bye. Bye.